And welcome back to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. Surprise. My name's Michael Walker. I'm here with my good friend, Mark Bigney. How are you today, Mark? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? Good. Did you get any good Black Friday deals? No, no. The problem with Black Friday deals nowadays is that we usually already have. Same thing with Christmas coming up. You know, usually you already have, if you want a game, we've already got it, so... There are two issues for me and Black Friday. One of them is, at this particular juncture, I don't have any money. Instead, I have things like a furnace and a mortgage. And the other problem is that Black Friday seems to be metastasizing. And I, I'm, this is not some sort of like, oh, war on Christmas nonsense. It, Black Friday used to be a day. Then it was a weekend. Then it was a week. And then soon Black Friday is going to start after October. And I can't help but feel that there's a certain dilution in the quality of deals as things are going on. Well, I always thought it was odd that stores would would discount their prices right before Christmas because people are going to pay anyway because it's Christmas time. I always thought it was very I don't odd. know, man. Retail doesn't make any sense to me. It, I don't know doesn't. how anyone makes any money doing anything ever. So This is also true. On the point of making money, Board Game Geek has <laughs> part of their, their annual drive to, to uh, support their website. I'm sure all or mostly all of our listeners have gone there once or twice. So please, you know, pop by and see if it's something that you want to give money to so they can keep doing what they do. So this is a podcast about board games, Mark. Is We're it? Gonna, yeah, it is. Uh. We're going to talk about some games that we played this week and what we thought about them. We're going to talk about news in the board gaming industry and how it, you know, affects us personally. Then we're going to talk about. I don't like where this is going. This is all this this change. I can't deal with this change. <laughs> then we're going to very. Te- Look, I need a moment to adjust. <laughs> then we're going to. I need about- to have thoughts, and now the, this news needs to matter. This what? What? I know it's crazy. Where am I? I know it almost sounds like we know what we're talking about. All oh, right, heaven forfend. And then we're going to talk about our feature game of the week, which is Last Bastion. So, Mark, what did you play this week? I get to play Marco Polo 2 Con Boogaloo. Ooh. Or, or rather, in the service of the con. I've been very much looking forward to trying this. This is by the same designers as The Voyages of Marco Polo. We talked about that last week in the context of our Eurus. We adore The Voyages of Marco Polo. It's one of our favorite midweight Euro games of the past 10 years. It was by Simone Luciani and Danielle Tashini, and it is arguably our preferred of their particular collaboration. They're both very prolific Italian designers. I came into it worried, based on my reading of the rules and my understanding of the components, that Marco Polo 2 was going to do away with one of the things that I particularly enjoy about Marco Polo the first, namely how tight it is and how difficult it is to get things done. Not in the punishing sort of feed your workers kind of way, but just in the sort of voyages are expensive and you have to save for them, and then it's a big turn to get anything done. And sure enough, Marco Polo 2, in the service of the con, was vastly more loose. Everything was so much easier to come by. You need money, you can go get money. You need jade, you can go get jade. You want resources, go get resources. You want to travel, there's now three ways to travel instead of just one. And all the ways to travel are cheaper now. The costs are smoother, and there are a number of of substantial improvements, but by the same token, there's also some weird, not cruft, but elements that are strangely disjointed. There's this whole element of seals, which are this extra side thing of getting seals and upgrading seals, mostly so you can pass through certain bottlenecks. Anyhow, it's one of those rare sequels that is that feels much less refined than its predecessor. Normally, I expect, especially with quality designers like this, I expect to take a base game and they're like, okay, these elements didn't work, we're going to get rid of them. These elements didn't work, we're going to shave them off. And then you get to a second edition or a second version that is so much cleaner and nicer and tighter. Marco Polo 2, although not sloppy and certainly not a sprawling mess, on a continuum from tight focused experience uh, on on one extreme, now we're playing a game of wavelength. Everyone can play along with your plastic discs. On tight focused experience on the one hand, all the way to point salad, Marco Polo 2 is much further towards the point salad area. Let me just put give you one example just to give you color of what was going on. By the end of the game, everybody was one house away from the house bonus. In order to get a house bonus in Marco Polo, you need to put out all but two or all but one of your houses. And this is a Herculean task that requires considerable focus and effort, and maybe one or two people might be able to get there. In this game, everybody was there in a four-player uh, four game. That alone, and, uh, and this was with new players as well, that alone was an indication that things were just a lot easier going into it. Now, this doesn't necessarily make it worse. In no, terms of, it could be just like a totally different game. Exactly. 
which is unusual because, you know, 90% of the rules are exactly the same, and another 5% are roughly analogous, and it's only about 5% that's entirely new. So it very much lived up to my expectations of my not enjoying it as much as the first one. Now, did my expectations color the experience? Maybe. I don't know. Everyone else at the table had a great time with it and thoroughly enjoyed the game, but none of them were veterans of the original Marco Polo. So I'm curious to, I'm very curious to see what you're going to think. I'm curious to see what my impressions are after a couple more plays. But honestly, if this is where I end up, I'm going to get rid of the second one and I'm going to keep the first one, honestly. Uh, which is weird because I keep a lot of redundant games in my collection, but it just, it's, it's very much not what I appreciated about the first game. So that was my experience of Marco Polo 2 in the service of the con. That's, that's all I like. It's been hitting that recently. Like we, we read the rules of a few games and just expected something and got it, which is, which is odd. Because usually, that odd? no, I mean, just mean a lot of times we're surprised or, or we're excited and then it doesn't play out. Just lately, they've been playing out exactly like we predicted, which I, in my opinion, is it's odd. weird. Sometimes after, after a few years in the hobby, after reading several hundred or several thousand rule books, you start to get a sense of some games and some games feel very much, or at least some details of games. I shouldn't say de- games in general, but some details of games are going to play out very much as you expect based on reading them in the rules. If you get a solid sense for, for how it's going to play out. Sometimes you just don't know. For example, a splatter game. Splatter games tend to evolve in these strange organic ways, and I don't have a good sense of how a splatter game is going to play when I am reading the rule book, with certain exceptions. Roads and Boats, I, I definitely got the impression how Roads and Boats was going to play out, and sure enough, it played out that way. But, you know, Food Chain Magnate doesn't necessarily communicate the degree of cutthroat savagery that one experiences, or how easily you can turn on a dime. But in the case of Marco Polo 2, I definitely got the, the the impression that, oh yeah, this is easier than the first edition, this is easier than the first edition. Would I have had an appropriate sense of how the game felt had I not played Marco Polo 1? Probably not. So, in general, I don't know if I, the, the rule, rule book alone would have communicated the game experience, but insofar as it differed, I very much got that impression. Maybe it's one of the more approachable, right? Not so punishing. Yeah, that is absolutely something that is a matter of preference, and I am, I'm fully open to the fact that, that other people who felt that Marco Polo 1 was too punishing, the second might be more to their taste. On the topic of subtle changes in second editions, I also played Catan Starfares. This is the latest printing of the Starfares of Catan, but now everything has to be rebranded with Catan colon something. Settlers is now a verboten word in the uh, Settlers universe, so it's just Catan Starfares. And I very, very much liked the Starfares of Catan. It was, I think, my favorite Catan game all told. I don't have problems with the Catan formula by itself. I just don't like the base Catan game. I don't like how it deals with resources. I don't like how things clog. I don't like how you can get locked out of the game based on early setup. All of these things are are things that I don't appreciate about the base Settlers game. But the core element of getting resources by building in certain plots and playing with probabilities and building with little recipes and getting little goodies and stuff and trading, that part I really like. And Catan Starfarers is very much what I like out of the formula. And it, it, and it smooths out some of the problems with the base Catan formula as well, in that when you are at the early stages, you just get random influxes of goods on top of whatever the normal production roll is. And that's very helpful. Just a little shot in the arm to get things going. I really like the random events in Catan Starfarers. You get to encounter aliens and pirates and things. Yes, they are super random. Sometimes they can be incredibly arbitrary. And uh, sometimes you can end up in those one of those situations where you encounter a friendly merchant and you give the friendly merchant as many goods as you can, only to find out that the merchant is then offended by your generosity and then you get punished for giving more than you... Anyway... Those are those are elements for me of its charm rather than necessarily problems of it, because when you get smacked by events, it tends to be not particularly punishing. It's not going to take points from you. It might take half a point from you, maybe, but it's not going to steal anything that's substantial in terms of your infrastructure. And you get to go out and encounter cool stuff and get new techs and all those other things that you might expect out of, out of a science fiction game. And oh my goodness, the components. And how much, is it, how is, how much does it differ from the first one? Uh, very, very, very little. It differs in that you get more goods at the start of the game, and it differs in that the map is now modular. In Starfarers of Catan, it was one of the only Catan games where there was a static board that you then put out random numbers. This has actually become more common uh, with the Catan variants, actually, the whole static board. But 
Catan Starfares does not have a static board. You randomize the systems on top of randomizing the numbers on the systems. That part is neat. Some of the events, I didn't do a thorough inventory, but some of the events seems to have, seem to have changed, tweaked a little bit here and there. And the components have changed so that they're more sturdy. On the topic of components, anyone who's utterly unfamiliar with the Starfarer's components needs to take a look at them because they are ridiculous and they are profuse, and it is one of those games where you understand where your money goes. It's a very expensive game, but you know why it's there, because you have these beautiful rockets that you then graft pieces onto as you upgrade your mothership and all this nonsense. In the first edition of the game, pieces would tend to break, and they had to introduce various fixes. The redesigned rockets do not suffer from these defects. Anyway, Catan Starfarers is uh, rather longer than a lot of the other Catan games. You're figuring about 90 to 120 minutes. And it's a little bit less flexible than a lot of the other Catan games because, you know, it doesn't have an ocean of expansions available. The base game had a five and six player expansion, which, you know, again, if you want to play Catan with five and six players, I don't know what, what you're thinking. But I am glad that they republished Catan Starfarers. It's been 20 years in the making. And Klaus Tuber, he of the Catan Dynasty, was involved in the reprint and, again, the rules changes are somewhat subtle, but little tweaks in there. I had a great time with Catan Starfarers, and I am looking forward to playing more of it. I love the rockets because it's at a glance you can see what your opponents have, right? You don't have to like you know get up and look over at their board at these little tokens spewed across their tableau or whatever it is. You just look over, you can see that they you know how many guns or how many how fast they're going to move. I think it's a great, although expensive, addition to the game. Functional toys are the best. Gotcha. I only got to play one game last week. It was a busy holiday party season Niroshima Hex I've talked about it before or Niroshima Hex fantastic really two player game there are rules to play with more but it's really I would suggest only play two the base game comes with five armies it's really Niroshima Hex 3.0 is what they call it it's by Michael or Orez Orach I think Orach. I'm not 100% sure Portal Games Portal Games I think is the leader in supporting their games like, even, like, 10 to 11-year-old games they still support. They are putting out an, a new army for their Niroshima Hex every year. They've said they're going to keep doing this. There's another one coming out very soon. So what you're doing in Niroshima Hex is that you're drawing a hand of three tiles, and you're putting out two of them on this, you know, hex grid. And then eventually a battle is going to take place. Either you're going to draw a tile that you can play that starts a battle or the, or the whole board's going to fill up and that starts a battle. And all your troops that are on the board, they all have initiative values. So you start at the highest and you go down and they, and it's all about trying to kill your opponent's troops before they kill yours. Like trying to get a higher initiative, trying to outmaneuver, trying to, you know, use all the special abilities that your your particular faction has to, you know, destroy your opponent's base before they can destroy yours. I think it's a fantastic two-player game because there's a, you know, literally no setup. It's just like picking your army, putting it at your base and then you're you're into the game. You don't have to do all this crazy setup. You can even, you know, brush up on your new army while you're playing because you know, you can just look at the rules as the tiles, you know, because the base rules are, you know, fairly, you know, the same. You put out a tile you know, it's the next player's turn, and then you know, there's some, you know, either hand to hand combat or or range, and all the little tweaks. All the rule books are all identical, so it's easy to figure out. You know, all the all the special stuff about your army. Love Naroshima Hex. I would suggest it to anyone who is into two player games. I've been meaning to ask you, Walker. This is this has been something that's occurred to me for a while. What is your favorite Naroshima Hex army? Because at this point, there's over a dozen. I always, I always play uh, New York is what I always play when I have a choice. But I really do like them all. They all have a really, you know, intricate twist. Like they have the jungle, which all like the crazy aliens. And they have this giant worm that has all the special abilities. They even have an army that's like just three super troopers. And they all have these action tokens that let them be, you know, super crazy. It, it, they did a great job. And they're all, and there's not one that seems to be overpowered. Like uh, off the start, you know, they, a new one will come out and I'll have introduced these different abilities that you have to figure out how to, you know, deal with. But eventually, I love it. And there's like another game called Convoy, which is another fantastic two player game. There's a certain doctor I know that really enjoys it as well. We're not talking about Ryan Kennedy this time. I know. Weird, right? And it's based in the same world as, the only reason I bring it up is because it's based in the same world as Naroshima Hex. So, you know, you'll see your, you know, the same old players again. It's about this, you know, convoy of, you know, post-apocalyptic trucks rushing through these cities trying to get to its destination. And the one side's trying to slow it down and stop it while the other side's trying to blow through. I'd definitely try that. Check that out as well if 
two-player games are your thing. Well, one of our favorite tableau builders is 51st Date, which is also in the same universe, so. So true. I get to play a game I've been meaning to try for years, namely Kalos Magna Carta. This is the card game version of Kalos. It was released a couple of years after Kalos was released. And many people have pointed to Kalos Magna Carta as one of those instances of a card game that manages to distill most, if not all, of the excellence of a base game into a smaller, tighter, more compelling experience. And as has been relatively obvious, even from just the contents of this episode, I am always in favor of a tighter, more compelling experience. And I like bits of Kalos, but overall, I really think it shows its age and is a little too sprawling, a little bit too much, a little too long, a little bit too many tracks, a little bit more resources than it needs, etc., etc. So one of the primary ways in which Kalos Magna Carta differs from Kalos is it's it's still worker placement, and you're still putting out buildings on a little path that your workers can then activate. And sometimes the buildings won't activate because someone has decided to move a piece to screw you over. All of that is still there. But instead of there being a giant stack of available buildings, a la Caverna, basically, you have your private deck of cards that you pull from, and there are actions to draw more cards, there are actions to cycle your hand, to try to get the card you want. And through that, you end up manipulating the economy. In our game, for example, people did not get to their buildings producing stone until relatively late. And that was just a function of the card draws of our personal decks. And that influenced the economy. It didn't cause the game to, to stall. It just meant that there was a scarcity involved. And that, interestingly enough, moved us to do certain actions, especially since in Kalos, as in Kalos Magna Carta, if you go and activate an opponent's building, they get some benefit. And so there's a little more player interaction there than there would be in a normal uh, worker placement game where you're just plopping up buildings and then activating your own. In fact, you end up in this bizarre situation where you might want to build a building because you really want to activate it. But once it's built, you start looking at it and thinking, well, maybe I want someone else to activate it instead. And then I just get the benefit, which is not as good, but is free. And, and I don't have to waste a worker and some money. Anyhow, all of those parts, really interesting. And that, despite the fact that Kalos Magna Carta is about half the rules and about a third the playtime of a game of Kalos, w- was, uh, came through in spades. It also had the element that I really like in a Euro game, where what you're doing near the end is radically different from what you're doing at the beginning. The economy shifts, and as you're kind of sort of cobbling together, not necessarily an engine, but something approaching an engine, you then start pivoting towards different things, and different things become scarce, and you start moving on towards different tasks. I really liked Kalos Magna Carta. I don't think it was necessarily top tier, but in terms of condensing a Kalos experience, Experience, I thought it was uh, thoroughly engrossing. If you really like Kalos or you want to like Kalos more than you can by virtue of its length and its sprawling nature, I would encourage you to give it a shot. It's it's a very, very impressive work of minimizing and streamlining. I have not tried Kalos 1303. I'm curious to give it a shot. This appears to be the year of reworks and, and redevelopments and well, all that. Well, because we're very, very starved in the board game uh, yeah. market. We yeah. need to have more reprints. And But anyway, that being said, I'm, I really want to try it because I do enjoy Kalos. I've had Kalos right up to, you know, recently. And I've played some of these, you know, card Im- implementations of board games. And they, not, not, I shouldn't say they've done a terrible job, but they don't, you know, catch the essence of the game. Which I can see why. Maybe they wanted to make a totally different game just based in the world. But like you said, you played it off as this is, uh, you know, minimalized Kalos. Gives you everything you need and more in a shorter time. So I definitely want to give it a try. And it sounds like that's exactly what it is. This, you know, putting out buildings just so other people can use them, blocking people, all of that stuff. Does it have anything to do with the player order? Cause there's Kalis has a great first Mm. player. Does that do anything interesting with that? So off the top of my head, just to summarize the major shortcomings of Kalis Magna Carta as compared to Kalis, one of them is player order. Turn order is fixed and you just pass the start player uh, clockwise. However, the important things for turn order, namely the order in which you move the provost, more than that in a second, and the order in which you contribute towards the castle, that is fixed by the order in which you pass. So if you really need to get that done early or late, you can try to jockey with turn order and stay in longer than you might otherwise or pass sooner than you might otherwise because there's reason to want to be either first or last in those cases. So that part, I would say, for people who really, really, really care about turn order and worker placement games, you're probably not going to be happy with the workarounds or rather the lack of mechanisms in Kalos Magna Carta as opposed to Kalos. The second thing is, and I don't know if this is a function of the cardification of the game or if it is a function of having played with three... The element of 
using the provost to deny people's actions was much less vicious in Kalos Magna Carta than it was in Kalos. And Kalos is, is, you know, you're playing a worker placement game and then suddenly there's this knife fight where everyone starts looking at the board and saying, hmm, for just $2, I can prevent you from taking your turn. Sounds good to me. And in Magna Carta, I don't know if it's just we didn't have enough money or we weren't building enough buildings to make the, the path really matter or we weren't pushing our luck as much as we wanted to. That element felt missing. It felt a little bit loose in that regard. And it didn't feel like there was the tight competition that there was in a normal game of Kayla. So, again, I don't know if that's just a function nature of the beast or whether it's just because of the particular play we had. A friendlier version. Yes, it felt much friendlier, but still, at the very least, again, as we've talked in the context of worker placement last week, normally I'm usually happy if you just have a little bit to nudge you in the area of play interaction, and the way the building bonuses worked, I felt was pretty good in that respect. The competition for other resources, specifically the competition for offering up to the castle, was still very tight. You know, you have to look around and see what everyone else can do and say, what can I afford? How much do I want to push myself this round? Things like that. So there's more more competition and direct interaction than there is in your average worker placement placement, which is pretty good. Not quite as much as the original Kalis, but there you have it. Finally, I played Vindication again, just to, just to contrast a, a sort of quasi-engine builder where you get to do different things over the course of the game. Vindication really, really emphasized to me that it really is, to, to my mind, a mediocre engine builder, because the way this game played out was exactly the same as in the previous game, which is every player moves towards building a combo, a combo that they built randomly through mostly arbitrary card draws, and then at near the as the mid to end game approaches, they just pump that engine to do the same thing over and over and over again. So the engine builders that we like, whether it's something like 51st State Master Set or whether it's some of the other Euros, they have subtle ways to make sure that you have to do different things as the game moves on and you can't just pump the same card over and over and over again. Vindication, if anything, is the exact opposite. You build a combo and suddenly it's your interest to just camp on one space and just shove things into the giant point points furnace, and then hope that your points furnace burns hotter than your opponents do. This is a terrible metaphor. I would like to apologize for it. I am already ashamed. But you get the idea. In both games of Vindication, I got to see engines just focused to a narrow point, and that narrow point was boring. Super boring. It's like, oh, well, this thing's really cheap for me, and it gets me five points every turn. I guess I better do this thing again that I did last turn, that I did the turn before that, that I lucked into by getting random cards. Still, it's a reasonably short, inoffensive game, but I, I just, I have no time for things like Vindication anymore. I do not understand why people are so gaga over Vindication. I, I mean, I guess I kind of understand. If, if you, if you're completely fooled and you're not paying any attention to what's going on under the hood, under the hood, and I don't mean this as an insult because some people just get carried away by the theme and just want to en- engage with the world in a certain way. I might be inclined to do that, but what's get, I'm, I can't engage with the world or engage with the theme because the underlying mechanisms just do nothing for me and feel so repetitive and dry and unengaging and random. Ugh. Anyway. So vindication gets no vindication. Are you pleased with yourself? <laughs> are, you, are you happy? Do you feel good about that? No, I feel kind of ashamed, but still <laughs> laughing on the inside. Yeah, no, Vindication failed to vindicate itself. Yes, thank you very much, Walker. So that was my experience with Vindication. And that is the games we played this week. Now, on to the news and why it doesn't matter. Days of Wonder has announced a partnership with Amazon. They have this, Amazon has this Alexa. It's much like, you know, your home Google or your your the thing that talks to you in your homework when you have a question. Or it's in, just your or, friendly spy that or, listens yeah, to everything you say and, and do. Or, you know, you need spelling. Anyway, apparently, you're going to be able to use this Alexa while you're playing Ticket to Ride. Do our listeners know that if they ever play our podcast through Alexa, we, Shh, we can hear everything Mark. that they... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Mark, read your paperwork. Anyway, so you're going to be able to put this Alexa on the table while you're playing Ticket to Ride, and it can either do both or one of, they can either teach you how to play Ticket to Ride or even act as one of the players of Ticket to Ride and play really? along with you. Yes. Not only will it play, uh, you know, like sound effects and music while you're playing, it'll keep track of your score and it'll do all that how stuff. How is it going to play the game? I, Mark, I, I, I don't have an Alexa, nor am I in the, in the, in the production <laughs> team. I, I can just, you know, although go. I saw the reason why I didn't read any of, any of this news is I just thought, oh, you know, the Alexa will teach you how to play the game. I'm like, oh yeah, sure. I, there's already a million and one videos to teach you how to play any game under existence, and most of them are crap anyway. I don't see why you need an additional venue for rules explanation. It says Alexa can join as another player. Wow, that's, that's what that's what I read. 
You mean instead of getting a friend, I could just buy a spy from Jeff Bezos? Exactly. Well, that sounds pretty tempting. Uh, what I want is I want Google to like put in a counter thing and they can like, you know, play against each other and, you know, see you. It'll be awesome. It'll be a battle. Anyway. That would be really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> This isn't so much as a news item as an excuse to talk about uh, the incredible kindness of one of the swag listeners. A swagger went to Japan and asked me if I wanted any of the Sakura Arms content that was available there that is not available here. And I said, uh, yes, I want all of it. And now, thanks to his generosity and his assistance and also a brief jaunt on Amazon.co.jp, I am now in possession of everything that has ever been released for Sakura Arms in their lovely little deck boxes with all of the lovely little inserts painstakingly cu- uh, cut out and inserted. Uh, it is it is glorious. I have played once with the new content. It's amazing. I love Sakura Arms, and it is a shame that it didn't really catch on in a way that AEG, who published the domestic version, wanted. The new rebalanced versions are really amazing. Now, the base set, the base English set is still amazing eminently replayable, but the additional content is really, really cool. It's now up to 16 different characters as opposed to the eight in the base set. There's even a co-op version, which looks very weird that I'm going to give give a try. Season five is about to begin. This is the nominal news item walker. Oh, this must be, is this where the the swimsuit? No, this is not going to be the swimsuit episode. (laughs) Although I will say some of the artwork on the new Megami are not, uh, they're they're, they're what you would call uh, boob heavy. Uh, So I'm not a huge fan of all the art design. Uh, some of the character design, I think, is great, but some of it is, is is a little unfortunate in the way that anime often is in its representations of women. But Season 5 is about to begin. It's going to have two new characters, uh, further rebalancing. So uh, suffice to say, if any swaggers are planning to go to Japan in the next few months, <laughs> hit us up. All right. Well, Mark keeps toting this game. I want to talk about Sakura Arms because Sakura Arms is yet another fantastic two-player game. Just the board itself has all these, you know, rose petals on it, you know, like the cherry, bl- sorry, cherry blossom petals. Cherry blossoms. I'm very sorry. Cherry blossom pedals that's you know moves all the tokens and it's like it moves through all these different pools and it's your how far away you are from each other it's how much you know chi you have or power or and they all move around and not only that all of these characters that that he was talking about you pick two of them and you sort of merge them together and you create these very interesting combos and because there's so many characters there's almost like i don't want to say infinite because it's not infinite but in the number of times you're going to play this game it's pretty well infinite all these you know different ways you can play these characters together and it's just a fantastic game i'd definitely try it if you could do you know what it is listed as when you have amazon.co.jp translated into english no new cloth cherry teens oh (laughs) (laughs) i i I can say having had to engage with japanese retail several times over the course of my life japanese to english auto translation is not what you would call advanced (laughs) i respect that it's a difficult task but uh all right joey shouten which i always also butchered that name i'm not sorry who joey shouten it's s-h-o-u-t-e-n okay shouten joey shouten he's an editor anyway of dice and ink it is the holiday season, Mark, and for a mere dollar, you can buy these Roll and Write Christmas cards. I thought it was a fantastic idea. So it's like a little mini game. You pay a dollar to to the, the Dice and Ink people, and they give you the PDFs, and you print off the rules, and you can send you know your gaming friends a, a Roll and Write Christmas card with the rules and all the stuff, and I thought it was a very interesting and cool idea. That sounds A, adorable, and B, roughly about as much as any Roll and Write game is worth. <laughs> there you go. Zing. Zing. So the first game from Osprey Publishing, Osprey Publishing being the company that is really, I think, going from strength to strength lately, they put out a lot of really compelling miniatures games rule set, among them Gaslands and Gaslands Refueled. By the way, last week I played Gaslands Refueled. It was great. I set things on fire. Everything burned. Burning is great. I love to set things on fire. And of course, I uh, crossed the finish line with a Mustang, as everyone ought to do whenever possible. Anyhow, their first board game, though, that they ever published was Pierre Sylvester's uh, König von Siam which is a really tight, really, really weird area majority game. And I love tight, weird area majority games. Anyway, it was rethemed and republished as The King is Dead. And they are going to be republishing it again with all new artwork in July. If you have not tried uh, Koenig Vogue Siam or The King is Dead, I highly recommend it. And Osprey Publishing is a great company that puts out great stuff. So keep your eyes open. All right. So... Fantastic Factories is a game that came out on Kickstarter last year. And just this past October, their 
the backers have been getting their games. And I don't know how I missed it, but I went through some of the stuff and it looks like a really fantastic, yet another, you know, roll the, you know, dice worker placement, build your engine, sort of like a Machi Karo style, create these factories, produce resources, make combos. So anyway, they've made a, a deal with Deepwater Games that they're going to start publishing it out so we can all get a copy. So look for it on your shelves and give it a try. The designers, Joseph Z. Chen and Justin Faulkner. So you say it is the holiday season. I do. I say it is the season of over-optimistic, doomed Kickstarter updates. Because what I love about this particular time of year is you start getting the... This is a rolling project, of course. It happens over the course of several months about all these well-meaning publishers who start talking about how they're sure that they can beat Chinese Chinese, New Year. It's like a race, right? Yes. We're very confident that we'll be able to get everything out by Chinese New Year. Let me tell you something. Two things are inevitable in life. Death and Chinese New Year. Nobody beats Chinese New Year. That's right. So all these people, I, I've already gotten two. I've already I, gotten two in my I, inbox. I will I will place my money on Chinese New Year every time. I will time. bet, yes, I, I, the two well-meaning Kickstarter producers who I think ought to know better. I much ha- I have much more respect with, with content providers who are like, look, we have an estimate, but we have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> Because, honestly, that is that is the upshot. So I've had two updates already that talk about how they're very, very confident. And this the factory assures them up and down and, and is sworn on a stack of whatever sacred text you want. Everything is going to be added. There's not going to be a trace of shipments left, except for perhaps the Canadian shipments, when Chinese New Year rolls around. Anyway, happy Chinese New Year, everybody. It started already. And that is the news and why it does not matter. Now, on to our feature game of the week, Last Bastion. Mark. Last Bastion was put out this year by uh, Repo Production. Uh, I, I, I honestly don't know how to say the company name in English. I don't know if it's Repos or Repos or Repo. I don't know. So, whatever. So, it's it, it's Repo Production. How's that? How's that as a compromise? That for, sounds, for, okay. sounds great. And designed by Antoine Boza. Now, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about Antoine Boza, but he's one of those designers, one of those French designers that, for me, is synonymous with lots of really interesting quality designs. Kind of like Serge Azé and Bruno Catala, but a little bit, even a little bit more consistent than they are. Of course, one of the differences between Antoine Boza and uh, Serge Lagé and, and Bruno Catala for me is that the latter two have produced a couple of designs that I think are genuinely brilliant. Senji, I think, is one of the, the best games ever designed. Whereas Antoine Boza has designed a whole bunch of games that I think are great, but not quite brilliant. For he, for me, Antoine Boza is like a dozen games that fall into roughly the 7 to 8 out of 10 scale on Board Game Geek, which is high praise. Uh, th- that That's good quality games. But just a, a, a brief list of some of the games he's designed that I really, really enjoy are Hanabi, Hurry Cup, Pony Express, Samurai Spirit, Rampage, or Terror in Meeple City, whatever you want to call it. Ghost Stories, a lot more on that later. Uh, he's also designed other things that are very successful that we're not really huge fans of, like Seven Wonders and Takedo. So he's been a very, very successful designer. He's very been very prolific. He's done a lot of different kinds of things. My favorite of his games, uh, with the exception of Ghost Stories and Last Bastion, more on that in a moment, is probably Hanabi, which is an absolutely brilliant game of cooperation and de- deduction. In terms of charm, I think his most charming game is Rampage or Terror in Meeple City. Any game where you're expected to blow people. Uh, sorry, I should rephrase that. <clears throat> Strike that. Any game in which you use your breath as a weapon. There we go. <laughs> to simulate the effects of a family show, Walker. Stop giggling. Wipe that smile off your face. Moving on. So... <laughs> He, <laughs> Repo, uh, Repo Production and uh, Boza put out Ghost Stories, which was a brutally hard, somewhat inaccessible by virtue of its rulebook co-op game. Punishing. About uh, Chinese Taoists defending a village from an onrush of monsters. And this year they republished it as Last Bastion with a couple of minor rules tweaks and kind of sort of in a vaguely generic Western fantasy kind of thing rather than Chinese Taoists and, and stuff from Chinese folklore. More on all of this later. Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary of what one does in Last Bastion? A lot of people compare this game to Ghost Stories because it's, you know, a reprint of Ghost Stories. I am going to compare it more to Pandemic. It's more like a damage control, much like a Pandemic where you're rushing around trying to, you know, reduce the trouble you're in. That's what you're doing in this game. You're looking ahead to seeing what's coming up on the next player's turn and saying, okay, that's really going to hurt us. So we have to get over there and deal with that before it's their turn. And in this game, the dice are not your friend. You're going to be rolling dice to to kill these monsters, but they're not going to help you, so do not rely on the dice. And 
after all this, if you're sure, still not sure what you're going to do, don't worry. Someone will let you know. <laughs> Damn. All right. So, Walker, I've, I've come to terms with something. This is more of a meta podcast statement. I've come to terms with the fact that the way I want to talk about things and the way you want to talk about things are fundamentally at odds, and that between the two of us, shockingly, I am the more flexible of the two of us. So we're going to talk about things the way you want to talk about things, which oh, is to say nice. we're going to do a death march through your good points, Ooh. and if there's a bad point that's a counterpoint to that, we're going to save it for 10 minutes later by the time people have forgotten about it. That's awesome. Okay, good. So I'm glad you're can happy. I beat, can I beat the drum like you promised I could for the death march? Absolutely. All right. So the first thing that, that, that I that I think of in terms of a, a definitely a Walker plus point, which is very, very strong in Last Bastion, is the flow is outstanding. That's what I have as number one. Absolutely. Why don't you tell us about this? All right, good flow. Much like other games, we love when the monsters act the monsters that are in front of you activate when it's your turn. When you're drawing cards, if it's your color, it's going in front of you. If you're full, it goes somewhere else. Or if it's someone else's color, it goes in front of them and it won't activate until it's their turn. So it's your turn. So there's not a, what we're trying. What I'm trying to say is that there's not a monster turn. The game's not going to stop suddenly where all the monsters take their turn and then so on and so forth. So it's your turn. Monsters in front of you go. Then you only get to do two things. You're going to move and attack in whatever order that you want, or encounter the square that you move to instead of attacking. And attacking is simple. You roll the dice. Did you get the right colors? No. Well, no. good job, Michael. You failed again. You're a disappointment. Me and your mother are very... Oh, sorry. I went <laughs> I went to a different place there. No. Yeah, so... Yeah, we, we, we should really stop playing games with your mom. The two of us really gang up on you. So, yeah. So, you're just rolling the dice, and did you get enough symbols to kill the monster? No. Then you didn't kill it. They activate their monsters. They draw a new monster. They move and or encounter, attack or encounter the square, and so on and so forth. So, the flow, like you said is perfect. Most of the time you just draw a card, you do a move and you do an action in either order. And there's no real, this is, this game came out, the original core of the game Ghost Stories came out before monster activations came in vogue. You know, this is before Gloomhaven. This is before things where you have to worry about AI. There's no AI to manage. It's very much more like Pandemic, as you said. We just pull a card and it does, and it does what it says it does. You have a, a threat appearing in a certain zone. And just the speed with which you go around the table really helps you feel engaged and the flow is outstanding and people often actually when when they're encountering this and this is this is striking because of the delay between the publication of ghost stories and the publication of last bastion we've become accustomed to monsters being complicated to manage and people actually get disarmed the people that i've taught this game to tend to overcomplicate things in their heads like okay so then this monster does this thing and then there's like no 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 no. it's very simple you pull a card you do you you move into an action that order that's it move on so that that is absolutely a breath of fresh air, and it you know it reminds me uh, again of the sort of the first generation of co ops like Pandemic and Last and uh, Ghost Stories where the flow was so much better. It's true. You are you get you are engaged the whole time, even though you don't get to make any of the decisions yourself. Okay, well, why don't we talk no, about no, no, that? No, then? no, no you don't get me. No, no, yes, no, we're no, moving along. No, so, you don't get to do that. Then <laughs> I'm sorry. You don't get to troll me with a more organic, concept-based, discursive, digressive discussion. Don't worry. I have it coming up several times throughout the whole thing, so don't worry. We'll be able to... We'll oh, that's it. great. That's just Isn't wonderful. Oh, great, great, great. All right. Good, good, good. So you mentioned difficulty. That is another thing that I really, really like about Last Bastion. It is hard. I am tired. We can we can argue, and we have certain dis- disagreements about how hard we want games to be. But I prefer it, especially on a first playing, when a co-op will beat you makes me feel like I have something to aim towards. And Last Bastion is uh, already ge- earning a reputation very much like Ghost Stories did for being a very, very difficult game. And the win rate is, even though I'm a, I was a Ghost Stories uh, veteran when I approached Last Bastion, my win rate is well south of 50%, usually with newer players. Playing with, with more experienced players, it's, it's better than that. And even then, that's on the default difficulty leveling. There's an, there's an easy difficulty level, and then there's also two harder difficulty levels. So once you've mastered it, it, it can scale up effectively to infinite. Now, there was there were more difficulty levels in Ghost Stories. There was a nightmare difficulty level, which hasn't really been ported over to Last Bastion officially. And it took some experts of Ghost Stories a very, 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 very long time to get to the point where Nightmare was a reliable win for them. And it, such was the difficulty of, of uh, the Nightmare difficulty mode that people of the internet were utterly and 
incredulous that anyone could beat the game on that difficulty. And this prompted uh, one of the people that I followed on Board Game Geek, a, a guy who's uh, alias is Sphere, to be like, all right, here's how I did it. Posted a full playthrough of how he beat Nightmare difficulty. Anyway, suffice to say, it's hard, but you can get better at it and the difficulty scales, which is great. I found the difference in Last Bastion is the fact that it doesn't feel completely helpless the whole time or punishing or painful, right? It always felt as though there was a way to do it or even though you were losing, it was sort of, it didn't, for I don't know why, it just didn't feel as painful as Ghost Stories did. Huh. I don't know why that would be. To my mind, it was, it, it, it felt exactly the same way where you always felt, you, so you never really feel comfortable even when you're doing extremely well and things come together just perfectly. You never feel comfortable because there's this constant pressure. But by the same token, even when things are going terribly, you usually have something to do. There's one little standout exception to that, and that is one of the boards when you are, uh, when you're doing very badly, one of the colors can mean you skip your movement. Which is bad. I don't. I don't like that because you're going to end up stuck and pinned in the same. Oh wait, sorry. No, I'm not allowed to criticize anything yet. You're going to ring a gong and then I'm allowed to say bad yes. things about the game. Yes, I have it ready. Well, anyway, most of the time, with certain very minor exceptions, yes, even when you're under the eight ball and you're losing horribly, you still have things you can do and try to make progress towards victory. All right, the victory conditions and loss conditions. Very simple and easy to understand. If there's three curses that come out, a lot of the monsters that come out, you know, will advance curses onto your, onto the main board. Grasp of evil. If there are any, if there are three grasps of evil in your village, then you've lost the game. And then, like we said, there was a deck. There's a deck of all these monsters that are attacking. Once you get towards the bottom, a boss will come out, and then you have a certain number of turns to kill that boss. And if you kill the boss, you win. So nice. Easy goals, so you know exactly how you're going to lose, you know exactly how you're going to win. I like the end game. The end game feels like an accomplishment. There's a little cap to the experience rather than the game ending with a kind of a whimper. That's one of the, even, even the top tier co-op games that I absolutely adore. Sometimes Pandemic, sometimes Spirit Island, but sometimes things like Seal Team Flicks. The last turns feel like you're mopping up. Yeah. There's not really much to do. And then you're like, okay, well, I've done this thing that I've done before. Here you get to go kill a boss. It's something we understand. It's intuitive. And it lets you feel like there are big turns, which is nice. So later on, we're going to talk about how sometimes your turns might be dictated. Like there's only one decent choice, but it feels though that there are strategies there. There's, there's six different colors. No, there's five different colors of monsters. So you can sort of see which, which, which colors you've killed, right? Cause there's like a, an even spread of all the things. So you can sort of concentrate on what you need to do. It's like, I need to get more of these tokens. Cause I think we're going to see more of this color. They're setting up the corners. The map is in this nine grid, you know, three by three square. And if you're in a corner space, you can attack two monsters at a time, as opposed to being in the middle, only attack one. So you can set up the corner. So you have better chances to kill more monsters. So I really think that there are definitely strategies that you can work towards, even though you you don't think you have a turn. What I was immediately reminded of about Last Bastion that I'd forgotten about Ghost Stories, and this is one of the reasons why there's an actual skill ceiling, there's a, there's a sense of progression, rather, of, of improvement at getting better at the game. It's not about remembering little tricks. It's not about abusing the system. It's not about system mastery. It's because every little decision matters. Those things that, at the, at, at the beginning of your experience with the game, where to place a monster, for example... You might think, oh, well, always put them on the corners first and then the middle later or something. No, that's actually not true. There are heuristics that you can learn. It's not that it's overwhelming at the start of the, uh, at the start of your play experience, but rather as you get more experience with the system, you start noticing these ripple effects of these tiny, perhaps insignificant decisions earlier on. You're like, oh, it, wait, oh, I moved the wrong place two turns ago. And now as a result, I'm not doing the thing that I really should be doing, or I put that monster in the wrong place two turns ago. And now I can't do the thing that is more optimal. And those are the kinds of things that you start to accumulate and that's why you get better at the game and so despite the fact that there's a very simple set of rules and it's a very straightforward turn structure and everything it's really quite impressive the degree of decision making that's going on even at every step of the game my next point is how the monster cards are set up there's three categories on the bottom of the card something that happens when they come in something that happens when it's the turn and something that happens when you kill the monster and i think it's just I like how they have it set up so it's the same every time. It's much like Shadow Rift I just came to mind. It's like they have, you know, the different phases. This is what's going to happen in phase one, two, and three. You can see what's going to happen. You can plan ahead and you can sort of figure out what's going on. I think it's – I thought that was an interesting way to do it. 
we talked about in just recent podcasts about when in co-op games, when you just leave monsters out on the board, it doesn't really matter. You can just let them sit there and nothing happens. In this game, not so much. You have three spots in front of you. And once, once they fill up, you're going to start hitting your penalty. Every, every character, sorry, not every character, every player color has a penalty for when their board is filled up. Like Mark said, one of the colors is you don't get to move on your turn. There's all sorts of different ones. So, Leaving cards out is not good because your board will fill up. So it's even though it's a weak monster or it's not really doing anything, you still need to worry about it. Yeah, that's one of those examples of those kinds of little decisions that you really have to be careful about because there's a temptation earlier, very early on when learning the game to think, okay, well, every turn a monster comes out, that means every turn I have to kill a monster. Well, that's suboptimal play. Sometimes you have to go and not kill a monster and instead activate a village tile to set things up. And then you start realizing, oh, okay, well, by that logic, I guess these monsters that don't really have ongoing effects are trivial and I don't really need to care about them. Well, that's not true either because as they fill up the board, they start to become very threatening. And something that seemed a couple turns ago to be a pushover is now borderline unkillable and causing you serious, serious grief. And so it's these series of, of, of layers about how to manage the influx of monsters that really helps, I think, to inform the kind of decisions that you need to make in the game in order to be very successful. Some quick points. There's a bunch of different bosses you can pick. There's a deck. Grab one, throw it in the bottom. Uh, quick setup. We've already talked. About, have I talked about that? I have not talked about that. Nope. Very quick to set up. Just in that, for that reason. Quick to set up. Quick to explain. Quick to explain. Uh, easy to gauge difficulty. There's eight different characters you get to pick from. All with their own unique sculpts. All I, the, I really like the art and the components in this edition. The components and, and art in, in uh, Ghost Stories were also great, but all the Taoists had the same sculpt. And now in Last Bastion, we have eight different figures, and the cast could be a touch more representative. It's mostly just white people, but whatever. That's a minor, minor, minor gripe. And I really like the artwork. It, this it was illustrated uh, by Pierrot, the French artist who did Ghost Stories as well. And I, I commented about this on Twitter. I love the cover art for Last Bastion. It's so ridiculous and stupid and awesome. And it uses negative space in a really nice way. And it's evocative of how hopeless uh, the, the, the game really makes you feel. So I, I really like the visual presentation of the entire package, all told. And, even if the theming has now become somewhat generic. And I've taken you see how I, I've taken a love to the rule book because on the cover of the rule book it has like a pre sketch of the. Uh, cover art you know and you can see like minor changes that they made at the end you know to come to the final artwork of the of the box and i thought that was really cool and the rulebook is now a million times better than the ghost stories rulebook was the ghost stories rulebook managed to take a simple game and make it borderline incomprehensible for a lot of people last bastion has smoothed that out and that was a much more comprehensible game and so not only are there models for your characters there's also some models for the the abilities you can do in the town. So there's like a trap ability that comes with this cool, like little mining cart full of traps. I prefer the golden Buddha, but whatever. There is a, a net uh, option where you can net an enemy and it covers up one of their special abilities that either, you know, they constantly have, or it comes up on a people's turn, or there is the, the standard the, the fantastic one, which is the giant banner pool. Oh, the and there's five different colors. So you go to that space and you put up uh, and you actually hook on a banner of that color, which gives you a bonus against monsters of that color. And, you know, it's, you know, about two inches high on the board. This is one of those instances where radio fails. Yes. But oh my goodness, I could talk forever about how much I love that standard figure and how the tokens work with it. It's, oh. Just, it's such a small thing, but it's, it's really nice. It's really nice. And also, it's functional. Because it stands up and there's elevation on the board, you can easily eyeball. Yeah, you know exactly which bonus you have for the yep. for your turn. You know what's up there. You need to know what you need to change it to. Love it. Uh, same thing, back to the setup, quick setup, but it also scales well with how many players. Like, we've played it with with different player counts. I thought it, the, it, it played the same. You know what I mean? I think it, it scales well. Yes. The monster powers. I thought they were, very, they were very simple, very in theme, didn't slow the game down. I didn't think there was any problems with any of the monster powers. They're either going to summon in more monsters or they're going to stop you from using these tokens or they're going to, you know, uh, steal one of the dice you get to use. I thought, it, you know, they all presented a different, you know, way to challenge you. And I thought the game lasted a good length. I didn't think it outstayed its welcome. I think it, it lasted just about enough. Yeah, it's very quick. It's set in the cards, you know, as long as it can be pushed, you know, it all, it all depends on the speed of the players. 
Right. Because it's, it's a set number of cards, so... The only thing that can slow the game down is if the influx of cards st- stops coming in, and that's because people's boards are full. Well, if people's boards are full, the game is hitting them upside the head, so they're probably going to lose so- sooner rather than later, so... So I suppose I should go back, because I said the only way you could lose is if you get three grasps of evil in your village, uh, but you could... All your characters could die. Yes. You have three hit points. If you take those, then your boards will flip over. And you sort of do a little reset, but now you don't get your special ability anymore. And if you take three more wounds, you're out of the game. So let's go right in. That as actually funny, not even planned. My first bad point, player elimination. Yes. I don't think in any of the games that we played, we had an eliminated player, but it is possible. It's one of those things where... Uh... Ideally, as I've been talking in the past, uh, the context of things like Hitsy Road or The Menace Among Us, the player elimination will be timed such that if you get eliminated, the game is probably going to end very, very shortly thereafter. Last Bastion does this most of the time, but not all of the time, because if you are playing suboptimally, both the person who dies and the people around them, it is possible for someone to get knocked out, and there'll be a delay between them being knocked out and them coming back. And then, if they die again, well, then they're gone for good. At that point, you're probably pretty boned, and the game's probably going to end pretty soon. But there are circumstances, and I've seen it happen, where somebody effectively sits out a little bit too much of the game by virtue of that aspect. You're right. Alpha game from hell. All right, so... We've talked about the good points in this game, how the flow works so well, how everything's so represented that it's easy to see all the information, how the character's special ability makes sense for their not only their figure, but for the representation of the character, so you know what all your teammates can do. But that all feeds into the point that you know everything that's going on, so people will take over this game. We just played a game uh, last night where we played with a person who I don't think, I don't remember them ever being like this, where they where they were taking people's turns and I, I, and I knew that this game had a problem in the first place. And this just doubled down on that 100%. Some people, and this is not a taste of mine, but this is a, this is a position that I can recognize and respect will refuse to play a co-op game. If it does nothing to mitigate what is called alpha gaming or quarterbacking, where one, where someone can tell someone else how to play their turns. Last Bastion does precisely nothing to get in the way of that problem. Now, that doesn't bother me a whole heck of a lot. I was about to say, I don't want to go 100% that it's a problem. Some people... Right, it's group dependent. We can play with a... I was about to say, you can play with a group that enjoys this as, a, as an entire experience that, you know, you don't, you're not in charge of your character. We're, we're all in charge of all of the characters and we're all playing this game and you just sort of like all feed people ideas and just try to pick the best. That's definitely going to, you know, feed onto the time. But we, there is another, another player in, in another group, if, if you tell him anything to do, he'll shut right down and, and, and not enjoy the experience whatsoever. Yeah. So if you, if you play games with somebody who is prone to alpha gaming, or if you play games with someone who strongly objects to being told how to take their turn, obviously uh, Last Bastion is something you should avoid wholeheartedly because there's a balance to be struck with pretty much any co-op game, but especially co-op games where most of the information is public in. There's a balance of collaboration. You want to hit the right note between tell me what to do, I don't know, I'm paralyzed by indecision and I don't want to let down the team, all the way to here, Louie, this is exactly how you need to take your turn. Let me be helpful and move your figure for you. Most of the time, I've been very fortunate in the places where I've gamed. I've been in the meaty part of that middle and everything has been fine. But I'll know a lot of people who are not similarly blessed with that situation. And again, sometimes some sessions can veer towards one or the other. It's a function of how much it bothers you and how much people are prone to it. So be forewarned. All right, next bad point. It could it could be to some people that there is only one obvious choice or one best choice. There is definitely ways that you can combo the the village tiles and and to make a, a better optimal choice. But sometimes it might just say, okay, well that monster is obviously giving us trouble. I have to go there and deal with that now. Whereas if you had you know if you just sit and think it out, there is a different way. But it could th- it could be to some people that there is on your turn an obvious choice every time. Well, I think that's just a corollary to the sort of bad alpha gamer, because most of the time when people are alpha gaming very aggressively, I can't help but feel that most of the time their advice is actually pretty bad. I don't know if this is just a weird personality uh, fluke or just a, a random occurrence of the people that I've encountered that are bad alpha gamers, but anybody who 
encounters uh, a situation in ghost uh, in ghost stories or last bastion and says there's only one right thing for you to do here most of the time i think they're going to be false because again small decisions that you make have these serious consequences down the road and yes sometimes a monster shows up that absolutely needs to be the first one killed out the gate you can't all the other monsters are of a secondary priority compared to this one. But it doesn't follow necessarily that that means that you have to be the one to go kill it. You could change the banner color. You could set out a trap. You could net it. You could do any number of other things or activate a special ability of yours, what have you, to set somebody else. Because this this actually segues into one of my um, potential negatives, but this is a playstyle one. Because if you get it in your head that you have to do a specific thing on your turn and you blind yourself to the other opportunities... You often end up in a situation where you start relying on the dice. And as you've said a number of times, the dice are not your friend. The way I explain it to people is whenever you try to fight monsters, here are the dice. Don't expect more than one success out of these dice. And sometimes you're going to get no successes. I don't know why it is. And I think, again, this is a function of more modern co-ops where people expect that they can just waltz up to a monster, throw the dice, and the dice will kill the thing. Overwhelming majority of the time in Last Bastion, that is not true. You will end up failing. And feeling a little bit like a failure, which it's not that harsh. I'm, I'm, why, I'm, Dad? Why I'm, do you hate me? I mean, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> so people do get trapped into a kind of investment fallacy, right? Where, well, I tried to kill this thing before and I failed. Now everyone else has to throw themselves against this. One of the big differences between successful play and unsuccessful play is being able to take a step back and recognize that the immediate threat may even be the immediate threat. But there are other ways to deal with it than throwing more dice at it. So I, I agree with you that it can sometimes lead to degenerate play. But I think sometimes that's the fault of the players, not necessarily. Well, that's what, that's what I was getting at, 100%. Sure. I'm saying that the player might feel that way, but it is not that way, I don't think. It does, however, lead to players disengaging with the game. Yes. Right. If you have convinced yourself that the right way to go about doing this is throwing a whole bunch of dice and the dice keep telling you that, you that you fail, that is not fun. So it's one of those games where if you play in a certain suboptimal style, it will not be pleasant for you. Now, this next one is just my thing I was thinking about today. I'm wondering, does it really need to have a variable map? Like we said, it's a, it's a, a nine by nine grid. Sorry, a three, three by, by three, three grid, grid of nine tiles and you just put them out randomly every every game. And... I think in a game that is such a low setup, I'm just wondering if that's another step that doesn't need to be there. I I, I like the variability. The, I, the, ge- not, the geography I'm, of the town, I think, adds considerably the texture of what you're doing. 100%. I'm saying it does lead to, to like, different gameplays. Like, I think a little bit, does, but does it really, like, you move to the middle, you can go almost anywhere, and does the, does the where the things are really matter when the monsters are coming out semi-randomly and you're pretty well moving to different sides? I'm sure it'll lead you. You know, you'd have to play it more to think about it. But just something that came up in my head. I'm just wondering if it's really necessary to have a variable map. Well, it matters more for some characters than others. The paladin, the paladin, for example, the paladin's special power is that she can fight and activate a tile instead of doing one or the other. For her, it matters a supreme great deal. And I'm sure if you if if people play the game over and over enough, then there's a way, there would be a way to meta game uh, monster placement if you know the tiles were in the same layout all the time. Right. It, it it changes the contours of where smart monster placement is, which, again, is one of those little things that you're not immediately going to notice. But on repeat plays, you're definitely going to get there. And on that topic, I actually think that Last Bastion, as well as Ghost Stories, has a fair degree of replayability. But... So you get the replayability from the different character powers. You get the replayability from the different bosses. You get the replayability from just the order in which the monsters come out. Uh, I th- I would argue you get more replayability from the arrangement of the tiles. It's a different boss every time. Exactly. But at its worst, and this is something that I think is true most most sessions of Last Bastion, even though I really, really enjoy Last Bastion, it can get a little repetitive. Because most of the time, that flow can start working against itself to, to be to the detriment of the game. Pull a card, activate your character. Pull a card, activate your character. Pull a card, activate your character. You don't really have anything to break up that rhythm unless and until things really start going sideways. And that's one of the reasons why I enjoy Last Bastion's crippling uh, difficulty sometimes. Because it's when things start to go really bad that that pattern starts to get upended. 
but the 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 overall rhythm of the game i do find a little bit repetitive unlike say you know i talked about how uh, a virtue of last bastion compared to say pandemic is last bastion is a great end game you kill the boss the game is over but at least in pandemic you're doing other things like there are these little break points in the middle it's like i've cured a disease we've cured another disease you get that sense of progress as opposed to last bastion where it's just this endless onslaught of monsters in a random order and then suddenly the boss shows up yeah, maybe a, a character leveling up step. But anyway, on that point of characters leveling up, it seems that because there's eight different characters and they all have different abilities, it does seem that there is a dream team evident. There are a certain number of characters that, you know, in conjunction with each other is definitely the best pick to win the game. Well, there are definitely better teams and worse teams. And this is one of the hugest differences between Last Bastion and Ghost Stories. In Ghost Stories, the powers were tied to the colors. And so red had two possible powers. Yellow had two possible powers. In Last Bastion, you just pick whichever characters you want. So you can end up with, say, both of the quote-unquote yellow powers from Ghost Stories in a game of Last Bastion. And so on the one hand, that gives you more flexibility, which is good, and gives you more variety and options. But it gives you a sense that the game is a little less curated and you can end up with some combinations that feel especially good with each other, which, which I think negatively impacts the excellent scalability of the difficulty. It's just another variable that uh, messes with the difficulty in ways that sometimes are very, very consequential. And that's one of the ways in which I, I preferred uh, Ghost Stories setup, although I do really do relish the variety offered by Last Bastion. All right. Did I mention the alpha gaming thing? No, yes. but you can tell me to mention it. All right. People have a problem with Pandemic, the fact that once the game is set up, the deck has been shuffled and your your fate is set. And one could make that same argument against Last Bastion. Once once the monster deck is shuffled, your 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 fate is sort of set. What order the monster is going to come out? Because that's going to be your most difficult sort of how the difficulty is going to hit you the hardest is the order in which the monsters come out. Sure, I guess. Is that a problem? No, not a problem. I'm just, I'm just saying that, you know, some people ha- say that is a problem pandemic. They don't have okay. pandemic because once the game starts, your fate, your fate. You're not saying that, but you heard. Yeah. People, people that's what are I'm saying. saying. I've, I've read some arguments about, about pandemic is the fact that once the, the decks are shuffled in there, then, you know, the game is set, whether you're going to win or lose or, or how hard it's going to be. And that is, could be said for, uh, Last Bastion as well. But I'm, I'm thinking just because, you know, the, the, uh, the town abilities and and how you can manipulate where the monsters go, I think that's mitigated slightly. Sure. Two more points. Sometimes I think you're you might be forced to do a suboptimal move, but this is the same in most games. Like when it's your turn, you might you might have put, and sometimes it's your own fault. You've put yourself in the wrong position. You didn't move yourself back to the middle. You you know you're there's no monsters around you. There's no there's no uh, town tiles. Same thing with the characters. I talked about a dream team, but I felt as though some of the the tiles in the town, some of them were much better than others. Some one, some we didn't use at all. Some you know are way more important than others. Anyway, back to the suboptimal move. Like sometimes you know you feel as though you're not contributing to the team. Sure. Like I said, if you have made suboptimal decisions, if you weren't a, if you weren't aware of some of these decision-making horizons initially, you might realize the error of your ways a couple turns later, and then the real challenge is taking the step back and saying, okay, I need to go and fix this and do some things that don't really feel effective, but are a much better idea than, say, locking myself into a bad investment fallacy of in, uh, of, of useless turns. And I, I've done that too. I did that last game, actually. I was like, well, I'm in a place that's, I'm in a bad corner of the board. Rather than spending a turn to effectively reset so I can go be helpful, I'm just going to keep doing a dumb thing because it feels more successful. That is just bad play. My last point is, I don't know what I did to the dice in Last Bastion. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I, you know, some so somehow insulted them or, or, gay, or was me. I, I don't know why they hated me so much, Mark. Why did the dice in Last Bastion hate me so, so much? The dice are very punishing. So as a final coda, let's talk a little bit about what's changed between Ghost Stories and Last Bastion. I talked already about the character the character setup being more flexible. They're not tied to player color- colors. Uh, it leads to more cosmetic variety in terms of the different characters, and I really do like the minis and the sculpture. The rulebook is much better, as I mentioned. The theming is a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the Orientalism in Ghost Story. It's not a huge deal. It's not a, it's not a deal breaker by any, any, any stretch of the imagination. But by the same token, Last Bastion is pretty generic Western fantasy. 
The biggest difference, I think, in terms of whether you want to go for Last Bastion or for Ghost Stories is Ghost Stories does have two expansions already released. It's got White Moon and Black Secret. Now, I really liked White Moon and I did not like Black Secret, but if you've already gotten into the rhythm of the game and the simplicity and accessibility of the the, the core system starts to become a problem for you and you'd like to mix things up, well, if you're playing Ghost Stories, you can start introducing the villagers from White Moon, which... Let's you rescue people, and there are weird elements of uh, it introduces a new loss condition and a new way to help yourself out and so forth. But by the same token, if you prefer the uh, the the cosmetic aspects and the theming of Last Bastion, and you'd rather not have to deal with the rulebook or the additional complexity of some of the things of Ghost Stories, Last Bastion is available to you. I will say though, as a, as a way to sum up, that I I think that Last Bastion is a great co op game for all the good reasons that we talked about. The only serious problem I have with it is this issue of things being a little bit repetitive at times, and it's, uh, well, actually, I'm not even bothered by the alpha gaming problem, so let no. for, for, so forget that. No. Other people are, though, which limits my available pool. True. I guess that's why I was tempted and to I say I think it. the repetitive, I think it's short enough that the repetitive is not a huge problem. Right. But all in all, where Last Bastion ends up with me is I think that very much like Ghost Stories, it is a great co-op, but I don't think it's among the very top tier of co-ops. When I think about the absolute best co-ops that I can sit down to play, I think of things like Seal Team Flicks, Assault on Doom Rock. I think of Spirit Island. I even think of some of the pandemic variants like like Rome is probably my favorite. I don't think that Last Bastion quite reaches the very, very top tier. I'm glad I have it in my collection. I'm going to keep playing it because it's much more accessible than a lot of those other co-op games are. And it's much faster. But at the end of the day, I feel like the additional complexity and length that some of those other co-ops offer does pay off in terms of quality of experience and decision making. 100%. There's nothing I can add to that because I agree with all of those points. All right, then. Thank you very, very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, dice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at the games you like. For a more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, and you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. If you like the show, tell a friend. Final note, this has actually been bothering me lately. We don't talk a lot about our Patreon. We do this because we don't want to bother people and hassle them into giving us money. We don't like talking about that. But I realize that it could come off as a lack of gratitude towards our Patreon supporters. I hope it doesn't. I really I, do. I, I really hope it doesn't either. We are incredibly grateful. Yes, to... 100%. And we, I don't want to mention it because it really sounds, when I hear it in other in other mediums, it exactly. sounds as like advertising or Patreon yes. or begging or or self-promoting, and I, I really hated that. And we don't want to waste the time of people who exactly. are not inclined to give us money, because that's fine. We're not here to waste your time. Any time you give us, any time you want to listen to us, we're grateful for. And if you give us any f- support past that, we are incredibly grateful for that. I just don't want our silence on the matter, our reticence to discuss the matter regularly on the show, to be interpreted in any way as a slight to the beautiful swaggers that have decided to spend their money in a foolish way by supporting us. 100%. See you next week. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>